Hello, I'm Fei Kwan and you're tuned into It's About Youth. Today we're delving into the comedy industry in Malaysia. How has the landscape transformed over the years and what ingredients fuel the pursuit of enacting laughter? Joining me on the show today is a local stand-up comedian and MC, Guy Janat. Thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you so much, Faye, for having me here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, now, firstly, you weren't always a full-time comedian. Um, you Correct. have a background in mechanical engineering and yep. then you started out in IT consulting. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that transition towards um, stand-up comedy. Uh, what inspired this transition? Sure, so it started back in February 2012. So that was my first open mic ever. I still remember it was in Publica. I did three minute spot and then it went well. So at that time I was a final year mechanical engineering student. Mm -hmm. And to me at that time stand-up comedy was just a hobby. So I was just doing it part-time, right? Yeah. Then uh, 2013 I graduated as an engineer. I never worked as one, worked as an IT consultant in Accenture. So I was still doing stand-up comedy as a hobby, just part-time, you know. And then in around 2016, then I realized, hey, you know what, this could be a career. So I just like, monitored it, but I still did it part-time, mm -hmm. you know, as a hobby. And then in 2018, I said, you know what, I think it's time to make the jump. So after six and a half years of doing stand-up comedy part-time, I made the jump in mm -hmm. 2018 to be full-time. Wow, okay. And it's, so it's been o over 10 years since you started stand-up yep, comedy. Correct, yeah. Was there a particular turning point that made you think like, oh, this is what I want to do full-time, rather than from a hobby, this is a full-time job now? Yeah, so it was around 2016 when, because uh, I track every single expense, I also track my comedy income. Mm. Uh, so there was at one point I, I drew the extrapolated, I extended the lines of both uh, lines, and then there was an intersection. And I was like, hey, hold on a second, my uh, comedy income is uh, increasing uh, quite high, and in future I could make this into a full-time career. Right. So I just kept that in mind. So I just monitored it. So that's when, that was the tick moment for me. And then for 2018, I made a jump because I was hitting a ceiling in terms of my corporate career. At that time, I was a consultant. Uh, consultant in my company means like an assistant manager. And for me to move to a manager, I needed to do way more things, spend more time. Yeah. It's the same for stand-up comedy. I was hitting a ceiling. Uh, basically, I got time constrained. So I did all my checklists and said, you know what, I think it's time to make the jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, it's still a very big step, even though, you know, clearly you planned it out yeah. ahead of time. You took your time as well, yeah. six years in before you made that jump. Were there any other specific um, strategies that you employed to make it like a, your, to make your passion a, a sustainable career? Because as it is, I'm assuming now that it's not always a steady income monthly, yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. correct, yeah. So when I, when I made the jump, there's a, there's a certain checklist that I went through. So again, applying my consulting skills <laughs> to my right. career. So I did a simple checklist and I always tell myself, we cannot run away from a couple of things like money, time, people, yeah. health. Mm -hmm. We deal with all of this like every single day. So management of all this is very important apart from your main skill set. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people in the, uh, not just in the entertainment industry, but any industry, they focus so much on the skill set without having this four. Yeah. And this was the okay. most important because like we, we, we spend time every day. So the main one for me was finance, right? So finance, Realistically, I, yes, yeah. finance. So for me, I made sure I got uh, sufficient savings. I have uh, diversified uh, investments. I had to make sure that everything was in check. Mm. And I also track my own expenses, which is something a lot of people don't do. Uh, so that really helped a lot to actually make the jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and here we are. Yeah. Uh, you also recently had your Netflix special yep. um, on December 1st. Yep, correct. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Uh, how does it feel, you know, working so hard in these past 10 years and now to have your comedy, your craft on a global platform? Oh, it feels really amazing. In fact, uh, unreal, you know, uh, that feeling. So the reason why is because my first 60 minutes uh, comedy special was supposed to be uh, in 2020. Okay. So I planned it in 2019. I already booked the theatre and I got the poster all ready. And then we all know what happened during 2020 pandemic. Mm. Thankfully, uh, you know, I was able to get my deposit back for the theatre. So that's very nice of them. Uh, okay. But yeah, it did put me down a bit. And then I thought of doing it in 2021, but then there was another lockdown. And I told myself, you know what, I got to do it in 2022. And when I did it in 2022, I said, you know what, let's, uh, let's do it in such a way where it's, it's a global material. So even though there's a lot of uh, Malaysian uh, topics there, but I made it in such a way where I think even internationals can sort of understand. Well, maybe not the entire special, but most of it. Mm. So, and then I tried to uh, reach out to Netflix and yeah, one year later, finally it's on a global platform. And it's nice because there are not many Malaysians mm -hmm. uh, on this platform. 
who are based in Malaysia. You know, so right. it means a lot, not just for Malaysia, but the Southeast Asian community. You know, artists who are based here because it's more difficult as because uh, the industry here is not as developed mm -hmm. as let's say uh, US or UK. Yeah. So it's a uh, to me it's like a big win for ASEAN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to tap into to the the industry and how it's changed yeah. in a bit. But you you talked about COVID nineteen, yeah. the pandemic. Um, it has obviously it's impacted a lot of industries, yeah. especially the entertainment industry. Yeah. Um, how would you say it affected your job? Obviously, it cancelled your big your big yep. special, your one hour special, but how did, in other ways, how did it impact your job? And I suppose, how did you navigate these challenges to continue pursuing your passion? Yeah, initially I thought it was a very short break. I think most of us thought it was you a thought short it'd be break. two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we all thought it was two weeks, for, you know, one month. I said, hey, it's a nice break to just chill out, you know, healing period. <laughs> so I took a, but after that, then I knew it was going to be serious, right? So I took a step back and I asked myself, uh, is this the first pandemic? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of uh, other outbreaks, right? We, we talk about Spanish flu, uh, SARS, Ebola, Nipah virus, everything. Which means it's going to be periodic. We just don't know when the next one is. So I told myself, I've got to find a solution if I've got to think long term, mm -hmm. right? Because if I suddenly find a, a workaround, it's not going to happen for the next pandemic. So I told myself, uh, you know what, let's just try virtual comedy. So all Malaysian stand up comedians got together. And then we went up on Zoom and then we test different settings, you know, unmute the audience first, another one is mute, then we, you know, type haha in the chat box and all that. And somehow it works. Okay. So we found a good thing. And even companies were also learning how to do virtual employee engagements. Mm. So around like the third, around the fourth quarter of 2020, that's when my career started to uh, shoot up again. A lot of virtual uh, corporate gigs. Mm. Yeah. And that's become like a norm. And then now we are back to live slash hybrid. Yeah. That's great. Pivoting and in, sort of incorporating the digital part of it. Yeah. Uh, so now it's so now you're doing both live and yeah, mostly live uh, and very few hybrid. Yeah. I like to move towards the, the, the that's your career mm. and your experience, but I like yeah. to move to the comedy scene as a whole in yeah. Malaysia. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? How has the landscape changed over the years since you you started? So I remember when I first started, uh, I was I was I was dealing with Dr. Jason, uh, Kavin J, who are both on Netflix, right? And I remember like Kavin telling me that uh, oh this is a good time because this is we are the the pioneer stage of stand up comedy in Malaysia, right? Mm. Now we fast forward 11 years, I think we are still in the pioneer stage but we are towards the end. The scene here is really good and I'll tell you why. Uh, Malaysia has got one of the best scenes in Asia. Okay. And one of the reasons is because uh, a lot of us uh, can actually speak and understand English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at a lot of international comedians, when they go to other countries, you'll be surprised. They'll be, they will not be performing in front of locals, they'll be performing in front of expats. Uh -huh. Because that particular country has got very low English uh, proficiency. I see. So it's the expats who are attending. So imagine uh, you're a British comic, you go to uh, X country X, right? And then you're performing in front of your own people and uh, you know, you've traveled so far. So that's why Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines stand out a lot. And the scene is great in these three countries. So yeah, it's been grown a lot. And uh, for Malaysia, we have got like four comedians who are based locally, okay. who are on Netflix. So that's a very strong indicator that our industry is growing. Okay, okay. Uh, it's nice, nice to hear that. What would you say are our strengths and our challenges then? As you said, um, we, we, we are, as we are shifting out of that pioneering stage. I guess our strength is versatility, mm. right? Because in Malaysia, we have more than uh, 20 ethnicities, uh, all kinds of different states, and uh, ASEAN is also very diverse and all that. So that is one of our strength, uh, versatility. Whereas, as compared to a comic, say in America, where they are only based in America, those who don't travel out. Yep. So the jokes may be very uh, Americanized, but Asian comics, we are more focused on yeah, doing local content. At the same time, we want to grow, we got to do international content. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a bit more depth in that way. Uh, so that's the strength. I would say some of the uh, potential obstacles we may face I think, yeah, we talk a lot about sensitivity, but if you think about it, like every single country has got a certain sensitivity. The mm. only thing is it's, it's a different thing. So yeah. pe when people say uh, Malaysia got a lot of sensitivity, not really because I've traveled quite a, 
around okay. and certain things that are not sensitive here are sensitive in other countries. I see. So okay. it's a very subjective thing, you know, because uh, sadly society thinks in a very binary manner. You know, are sensitive, not sensitive, that's it. They don't think in a spectrum, they don't think in a, you know, in 2D or 3D. Mm. Yeah, because uh, we spend like, you know, like 15 years of our life shading answers, right? So that's a binary <laughs> A, B, C, D. So okay. it's actually more of a, a spectrum, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, we're talking about sensitivities. Yeah. How would you describe the freedom of um, freedom of expression here in Malaysia? Yeah. I think it's still okay. You know, okay. I think the because you have to understand that it's always the the bad news that goes viral. Yeah. Good news never goes viral because it's just boring. There's nothing to talk yeah, about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So when something sensitive uh, goes out there, they'll say, ah, you know, Malaysia is getting more sensitive and all that. Of course, like the recent concert, there's a there's a kill switch. Yeah, that one's a bit of a. I was a bit sad initially to have a kill switch because Coldplay is just going to sing songs and then I don't <laughs> think they'll do anything silly. But uh, thankfully it was not used, so that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are, like I said, there are certain things that are sensitive here. But when you go to other countries, the things that are, uh, what do you call it, are not sensitive here are sensitive in other countries. Like here we can talk about ethnicity, not in a racist manner, but more in a, a diversified manner mm -hmm. to understand the culture and the background. You know, but in certain countries that may seem a bit more sensitive. I see. Yeah, but people don't talk about this because, again, uh, people are very skewed uh, when they come up with opinions. You know, it's either one end or another end. Mm -hmm. They don't like be in a neutral standpoint. Ah, uh, you know. So I would say it's still okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, in that sense, and you say you travel around or perform overseas, does yeah. that involve having to always study the local context to ensure which jokes? can pass and which can't? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we do have uh, a lot of Malaysian stand-up companies. We do have an international set here, mm -hmm. you know. But when we go to other countries, we've got to check certain references. So the first thing we always do is, uh, when we have an international set, we, we bring it internationally. We just check certain uh, references, like like here we say a car bonnet, right? But if I'm not mistaken, in America, they say hood. So if I'm going to America and doing a joke about that, I've got to change my, my, my words a little bit mm -hmm. so that they understand yeah. and all that. So this is just an example uh, in terms of references. Mm -hmm. Another thing is uh, when we travel to other countries, we also try to write local content as in about that country. That country. So that's why we, we experience a lot. We, we, tr we do other things and try to write uh, local stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I went to Auckland early this year and I did some open mics. I went to the zoo and all that. And... Yeah, I, I came out of that trip, maybe uh, I got easily 10 minutes of uh, Auckland related material, uh -huh. which are also international. I can perform it uh, anywhere. I just have to set it up. Yeah. So it's a constant, it's a, it's a job where it's constantly expanding your knowledge and learning about different cultures and different, yeah. uh, different sensitivities in different countries. Yeah. Um, from your experiences traveling then, where do you see um, lessons to be brought back home for our comedy scene to grow in Malaysia? Yeah, well, my answer is going to be quite generic and it's going to cut across all industries. I would say I'm very pro Buatan Malaysia. Actually, uh, for those of you, if you watch my Netflix special, towards the end, I actually put that like Buatan Malaysia on Netflix. And my, my I always tell Malaysians, you know, let's do Buatan Malaysia like Tahap Antara Bangsa, mm. you know, be international level. Right? So it's good to be Jago Kampung, you know, but. Uh, Let's compete with the international folks, and I believe we can. Mm. If you look at every industry, I've seen talent before where we are, we are there. Yeah. We, we have the potential to be you know, up there with the international folks. So I always tell people, if you do well locally, that's great, but always go international and bring your product or service internationally, mm -hmm. and that's when you'll be really be tested. And you will have a few hiccups, that's okay. But uh, remember, if you have hiccups, you know, that's a sign of growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trials and tribulations is all part of the journey. Yeah. How would you perceive then the level of support for the arts and culture industry here in Malaysia? Is there any improvements that you'd like to see personally? So I would say support from the people, I would say is great, mm. right? Because I think a lot of the people like stand-up comedy, right? In terms of, I would say like government support, I understand it's not as strong as other industries because I'm no economist, but the numbers aren't too great when it comes to uh, arts and culture. So I sort of understand. I do hope it grows. And uh, I, I do hope the government also takes note that uh, we have Malaysians who are, we have five Netflix comedy specials. Including yours. Yeah, including mine, who are done by Malaysians who are based here. And that is the highest amount, if I'm not mistaken, in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. We have here, Singapore has one. 
I'm not too sure about the other uh, countries. Of course, we have got uh, we have got Filipinos, we have got Malaysians who have got Netflix specials, but they're based in US. Yeah, so it's a different uh, ball game. So to have five uh, Netflix specials who are by Malaysians who are based here, that's a very strong uh, indicator. I do hope the government may say, hey, you know what, this is something great, you know, and it's also indirectly it's also promoting uh, Malaysia. Yeah. And we should be taking pride in all this Buatan Malaysia, right? Yeah. Self-made yep. comedians who are making it onto the yep. international stage. For you personally, your comedy incorporates a lot of your mixed heritage. You know, even yep. your Netflix special is called Professional Mixed Breed. Yep. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Um, how, how has this sense of identity influenced your comedic style and how does it resonate with, with your audience, especially in Malaysia? Yeah, sure. So it all starts off with uh, what stand-up comedy is all about, right? Uh, when we go up on stage, uh, you ask any stand-up comedy, what are the tips? And they'll say, you've got to be you. Okay. It may sound very generic, but unfortunately, we live in a world today where sometimes people put on an image and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be you, and it's important to tell the audience who you are. So you start off with your name, you start off with uh, which country you're from, which state, and that's where one of it comes in. Uh, you know, your ethnicity, your family, your culture, that's something you bring in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. Number two is also connection. The beauty about this is uh, when I share about my family heritage and all that, I get strangers from the audience who will come up to me and say, hey, you know what, I'm actually also a mix, you know, I'm a, I'm a Malay Thai mix and I could resonate with your mix, you know, oh. family and all that. And that's such a beautiful thing. I ask myself, what other occupation will actually have this scenario where a stranger comes to you being so happy and sharing mm -hmm. his or her family heritage? So I thought like this is very beautiful and it unites people. You know, you get to see people from different backgrounds, you know, just all laughing together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it started off that way and, it's, you know, it just started to grow from there. La. And from there, I started to move on in more international stuff. Because I try not to be too heavy on uh, being Chindian and all that. I try to have uh, in a diversified uh, topics. So in my special, there's some about travelling, some about animals, some about mm. education. Yeah. Okay, what's the process of... Um coming up with this, all your material, like because you are drawing it from different aspects of yep. your life, how does it work? It starts off with an idea, mm -hmm. right? So what I usually do is if I find an interesting idea or a potentially funny idea, I'll just jot it down on my notepad in my phone. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm free, I will go and expand it. And how we expand it is we first ask ourselves, why are we telling the story? You know, and then after we, we just write it out, just like literally just vomit out, just, you know, write things out. And then we see, hey, how can I make this funny? And then apply all the stand-up comedy techniques, all the punchline setup, mm -hmm. and all that. And then we tested an open mic, which is basically like a R&D facility for uh, stand-up comedians, you know, a testing facility. Then we test our jokes, mm -hmm. and then after we after we do a feedback with ourselves and how can I improve the joke, we do that again, do this in a in a cyclic manner, until it becomes really solid, and then we bring it to a bigger show a non-open mic show, uh, like a you know, weekend stand-up comedy show. Okay. And then we bring it to an even bigger show. And then once you have lots of uh, grade A material, mm -hmm. and hopefully then you can lead to a one-hour special. Uh, yeah. What would you say are some of the, uh, the common barriers faced by comedians as they are working to grow their craft? Interestingly, the answer is not related to the stand-up comedy. I will say finance. Uh, finance. Yeah, because it's always, back to it's always finance. Because people in the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. I don't think they will have an issue with working on their craft because they spend a lot of time. You ask any musician, they spend a lot of time playing guitar and all that. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them about uh, finances, they are always uh, struggling. You ask how many of them uh, got a retirement plan, none. How many of them got a uh, backup, none. Uh, how many of them know their insurance policy? I uh, don't know. Uh, how many of them uh, know how to diversify the investment? Don't know. Mm. How many of them track the expenses? Don't know. Uh, how many of them, you know, are making use of compounding interest? How many of them are taking note of hyperinflation? Mm -hmm. So when you're unaware of all this, you do not have a safe uh, blanket for you, yep. and this will. Imp that's why a lot of people got impacted in the pandemic. Yeah, in, during the pandemic, I actually had like five months of zero income, and I could still go on for many months of zero income because I have a nice. Uh, financial backup. You had a contingency plan. Yeah, that's plan. why I always tell people in the entertainment or creative industry that like, you got to 
take note of your finance. Craft, I think eventually people will, if you're in the industry, you just talk to the, all the seafoods and all the masters. They, you can guide or you can just YouTube and learn and just practice all the standard thing, you know, practice makes perfect. But it's more on the uh, finance, health, time management, yeah. Thank you for being very real on that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it all boils down to, um, I suppose, being both funny and financially literate yeah. to, to ensure it's a sustainable career. Um, for those who are aspiring to pursue their dreams as you did, um, in comedy or in any creative field, I suppose. Yeah. What advice uh, would you offer based on your experiences and lessons? So I think number one is always why. Mm. So do not do anything without understanding the why. Mm. Among all the questions, uh, why is the most important? You know. So if you get your why wrong, uh, everything else will be wrong. Yeah. So if you if you don't spend enough time with you know yourself without knowing, hey, why am I doing this? Rather than, hey, you know what, I just want to do this. Some people hot, hop on a bandwagon that is really uh, hot. Like, you know, oh, that is trending. Let me just do it uh, for the sake because it's trending. They keep jumping. And then they realize, hey, you know what, I spent 40 years without knowing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So when you spend, when you know your why, that leads you to your purpose of life. And ideally, your purpose of life is to solve a problem that is facing by society. Mm -hmm. So Very for me, it's to make people happy. And one of the problems is, you know, uh, sadness and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Why first? And then the second thing will be to actually have the, the skills of you know time, health, people and money management. Have that all checked in mm. and then slowly work on it. And treat it, I would say treat it as a hobby first. Yeah, you got to enjoy what you do and do what you enjoy. So if it takes off, it takes off. If it doesn't take off, that's fine. I've seen people who are talented, who are singers, who do it as a hobby and then try to make it part-time but eventually went back to corporate and that's totally fine. Yeah. If it takes off, it takes off. So don't be so rigid and uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, learn how to diversify as you reduce risk. Yeah. Okay, so taking the time to sort of find your own pace and your own footing in this world, in this yeah. industry. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add on, Gajan, regarding this? Uh, nothing to all. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching here, actually I said nothing and then I said something. Yeah, <laughs> it always happens, right? Yeah. Uh, to all of y'all watching, uh, please watch my uh, Netflix comedy special. It's available worldwide. So if you have friends in anywhere, you know, in Europe, uh, Africa, uh, America, tell them that they can uh, also watch it. And it's international material. There you have it, Gajan Nat from uh, Professional Mixed Breed on Netflix. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences with thanks, me. Lofi. Yeah, thanks, Lofi. Thank you. You've been watching It's About Youth with me, Fei Kwan. See you next time.